Hello. Hello all. Nice to see you here. Let's hope this works. Yes, it does work. Okay, so I will still speak about uh, cards, but I changed it a bit, uh, the slide, because it is all about knowing a bit of AI and uh, essentially on how can it trust AI. At least that's what I try. So I am uh, Isabel Praça. I come from the Polytechnic of Porto, a very nice city in the north of Portugal. I teach um, artificial intelligence and also cybersecurity. And I'm um, part of uh, ENISA as an expert working on security of AI and working also on the cybersecurity skills framework. Um, so um, I don't know if you follow, but within ANISA we've been doing uh, reports about the threats, the type of uh, attacks, and also the protections we can have when using AI for cybersecurity solutions. Um, and also, of course, uh, dealing with the new types of models, de dealing with the new types of programming AI. Um, I hope I, I can give you some pointers about useful things that are there that we can use and that we can benefit of in a way that we can really take benefit of AI in a secure way. So let me first um, try to make it uh, clear for those that are not familiar with AI, uh, what is the change here? So usually we have data and we code the type of function we want to apply to data. So we program and uh, we get uh, the output. What, um, what uh, we can do with machine learning is uh, we can take the data input, we can take the output and have machine learning to find out what exactly is the function, what exactly is the way to transform the input into the output. Um, this uh, changes a lot. Um, also, and sometimes I hear people saying, oh, it's uh, machine learning or it's AI. Oh no, machine learning is not AI. Yes, it is. Machine learning is a field of AI. Uh, there are other fields, of course, um, expert systems, rule-based systems, game theory, optimization techniques, robotics, all of that is AI, but machine learning is also AI. And deep learning is machine learning, kind of more complex algorithms, more black box. And um, Gen AI is essentially built on the top of deep learning techniques, deep neural networks, and large language models are Gen AI. And transformers are the most used architecture of um, Gen AI that is up today being used, and GPT and ChatGPT. I think I don't need to talk a bit a lot. Uh, sorry, a lot about it. So, uh, still clarifying some of these uh, fields. Um, when you look into the knowledge and the data, so here, the um, bottom left side of the of my slide, we can focus on knowledge-based AI that is relying on predefined knowledge, like for example, expert systems. We can focus on data-based AI that will learn and infer new knowledge from data. Um, when we go into what is discriminative and generative AI, discriminative AI focus on modeling um, for a specific domain based on the probabilities of what we can find in data, and generative AI generates um, data. It's, it's really generation of data, images, sound, etc. Narrow and general AI. Narrow is restricted to a specific domain, while general AI replicates human-like cognitive uh, abilities across a broad range of uh, tasks. Uh, some examples. Narrow AI voice assistance that I guess you all know. Um, general AI, some uh, complex algorithms to replace the reasoning of humans in uh, complex tasks like playing chess, discriminative AI, Amazon classification to, to extract information from images, 
uh, open Dali, open AI daily to generate new images that uh, resemble photographs or artwork. Um, sorry, I was going in the wrong direction. No, okay, I'm in the right direction. Um, how and um, how is uh, AI being used in the different stages of uh, cybersecurity lifecycle? So, for identifying, uh, we can use AI for user and entity behavior analytics and to analyze the behavior of anomalies, um, finding the indicators of security risks. On the protection side, uh, there are a lot of works of using AI for threat intelligence. And I should say it's the most uh, popular topic when uh, using uh, generative AI. And also on analyzed threat data to identify emerging threats and update the protection mechanisms. Um, to detect for intrusion detection systems and uh, to detect unusual patterns of behavior. We did quite a lot of work on this area using uh, AI for um, intrusion detection and using AI to set up rules to suggest to SOC operators to shorten the process of protection also when um, a kind of incident is found out. Uh, on the response uh, side for the forensics, for the investigation of root cause and the scope of attacks, and for a recovery, for post-incident analysis, and uh, to um, provide insights for a better um, response and recovery. Can um, machine learning be compromised? Well, uh, I guess uh, these are also very well-known examples on what we can find about examples on um, attacking uh, ML and fooling ML. Uh, we know for images that uh, using a filter, some noise can completely change uh, the figure from the point of view of the algorithm that will not um, find a correct uh, object. In this case, we still see it's a panda, but applying this noise, the algorithm will see it quite differently. The same here. And um, this is noise evasion attacks, but also we have patch evasion attacks. That can happen when we place some patches on an image and that could change uh, completely the, um, the interpretation the algorithm does uh, on the data. So, um, of course, we should take care. And essentially, not just we should build um, tools and go into the direction of secure AI um, tools, but also on um, using AI in a secure way when we are developing solutions for uh, the cyber domain. Um, still to give some context about uh, how can AI be attacked, this is from um, an ESA report, the security challenges of AI, and this is a, an overview of the life cycle of AI. Um, it, it is slightly different depending on the type of machine learning we are using, uh, but essentially we have three stages. We have the first one on the top, which is the data and the transformation we need to do to the data. And then we have um, the, model, uh, the model building, training, uh, and um, optimizing the model. And then we have, uh, okay, we put the model in place, we have it working, and how to monitor that, how to upgrade uh, the model. Uh, let's start then to look into how can this be attacked. Uh, it depends, of course, on the type of knowledge we have, but it also depends on at which stage of the machine learning life cycle are we trying to attack or to protect uh, the usage of AI. Okay, we can have um, targets um, based on um, the machine learning model. We can have different techniques at training stage, at testing stage. We can have different knowledge about uh, the model. Um, black box 
usually uh, it's uh, most of the times black box, gray box or white box. All of these implies different types of attacks and all of these of course imply different types of protections or security controls that we should set up when using this kind of techniques. So let's bring also some taxonomy about the type of attacks. Uh, looking first into discriminative AI and I guess that this poisoning, evasion, these are well-known um, attack types these days, but maybe we, we don't understand really where they came from. Um, so we saw that there is a stage where we train the model and then when we uh, tune and optimize the model and then we put it to work. So that's the inference uh, stage. For the training phase, um, we can have poisoning attacks and backdoor attacks. Uh, data poisoning by injecting some erroneous data to fool the model, to have it uh, learn not the correct um, function, to uh, poison the model, to manipulate it by um, some owner of the model, um, the backdoor side module to um, place um, hidden uh, algorithm, a hidden neural network that will be behind the normal task uh, attacking, and deep alteration to modify selected nodes. For the inference phase, we have the model in place, it is deployed and um, being used, and we can have Oracle and evasion attacks. Oracle trying to do some model inversion to find the training data by uh, questioning the model and model reversing by trying to reconstruct a similar model. Um, evasion and targeted when we uh, cause misclassification in any class or targeted evasion when we are trying to cause misclassification about a specific uh, class. Uh, generative AI, it's changing a lot the landscape. First of all, it's a democratic usage of AI. Non-programming, uh, people without programming skills can use uh, Gen AI for a lot of tasks. And yeah, it, it, it increases the attack surface. Um, and if you look, um, we still have poisoning, but we have some very particular uh, types of attacks that come from the way we work with Gen AI, like prompt uh, extraction and prompt injection. So um, the pre-training stage, um, we have also here the um, uh, poisoning attack when we uh, place uh, um, a wrong data there, arbitrary code execution to exploit the deserialization of vulnerabilities, uh, the poisoning um, on the fine-tuning stage of attacks and uh, again the backdoor. For the prompt extraction we have fixed attack queries and learning based uh, extraction techniques. And the prompt injection, the direct prompt injection like jailbreak attacks and the indirect prompt uh, injection like manipulation of knowledge base. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of threats that can interfere with the uh, AI and that can compromise the availability, integrity and confidentiality of systems. Um, so trying to bring a summary, we have poisoning, AI backdoors, evasion, deceptive malware, prompt injection, model theft, data theft and training uh, data extraction. Um, and on the countermeasures side, we can do data sanitization, backward de backdoor detection, adversarial training, input transformation, code uh, audit, uh, model uh, watermarking, um, data watermarking, cryptography, and federated learning. These are different approaches to get uh, privacy of the model. Look into uh, Mitre Atlas, that is uh, collecting the threat landscape for artificial intelligence systems. And I uh, would like to show you how it is um, evolving. So this was Mitre Atlas um, one year ago, June 2023. We see here a lot of the type of attacks that I was um, explaining to you. 
Look how it is uh, one year after. It's uh, populated by LLM's um, attacks and uh, um, uh, attacks and techniques. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a good point and, and to stay tuned on how this is evolving. Um, I like a lot to see how this is uh, being uh, systematized in this, uh, in this atlas. Okay, we speak about AI and um, as um, teaching uh, machine learning. I see um, all of us, uh, me and my students, um, trying to find the best algorithm to get the best accuracy. If possible, we want 100% of certainty on the results we are getting from machine learning. That would be something that we were concerned um, just with that if we were not uh, in a domain where we need AI to be uh, secure and we need to trust AI. So um, I'm not concerned just with accuracy. I want uh, explainability to establish a trust relationship. I want it to be fair. I don't want to bring bias on the conclusions that are taken. I want computational efficiency. We have limited resources. Some of us, some big, big players don't, but most of us have uh, limited resources and we have to take care of our planet. So let's make it just to the point we need it. And we want it to be robust. It should not fail even when someone tries uh, it to fail. Um, yeah. All of these can contribute in a very important way to trust this kind of technology. So uh, I will go a bit more deep into how can we uh, work uh, into this direction and to show you what we are doing also on the, um, on the applied research field because I, I have to say this, um, sometimes there is a gap between science or research and a business but uh, in between there is applied research that is done close to companies and really facing the problems they have and the, the way their solutions can be improved. Um, so let's see about applied research on increasing the robustness of um, AI, its explainability, fairness and the privacy of uh, the way we use um, AI. Let's also look at the standards. There, there are, it seems uh, there are a lot, there are not, and I will not bother you, bother you with this um, standards landscape, but I need to tell you that we have a first standard that was launched in December 2023 from ISO, and we have also Etsy producing a lot of materials about um, security of AI and uh, the threat ontology is one of those that is already published quite some time ago. Um, but we, we still have um, other types of standards like the labeling of information and uh, <coughs> yeah, the artificial intelligence management system. And I, I have it here not to go deep into the standards but to show you that when we speak about labeling information, we speak about identify, manage, and control information to enable efficient and correct searching, uh, to facilitate systems to interact and make decisions. And uh, artificial intelligence management system, we uh, are worried also on responsible AI, reputation management, AI governance, practical guidance, and identifying opportunities. And if we... Um, take this information world uh, into the context of what I want to talk about. Information is the data and information is the models. And my uh, ambition is to secure, to identify, to manage and to control data and models in a way we can have responsible AI and we can have um, good usage of AI. So, is that possible? Um, Okay, that's what we want. How can that be possible? And what can we do to make it possible? Um, identity cards. So all of us, we have certain characteristics when we uh, speak about uh, our identity. People come to know our name, our nationality, um, can know 
our uh, birthday. Um, when we talk about food, for example, we can understand the type of uh, um, the type of calories. We can understand what is being made of. Uh, this gives information that makes us trust uh, people and somehow also trust food. Of course, that uh, to have it all and to to be um, in a healthy situation, we should match the food with who we are and with our own characteristics. And um, why do I speak about it? So I want to have cards that make us trust AI. That is something that is not just based like uh, um, on our own identity and on the food identity, for example. It is based on data and models. And as for some people, the nutrition facts may be different. Uh, also for some data in a certain context, the model and the secure controls we need for the model can also be different. So... Um, Data and model cards. This is not new, uh, by the way. Uh, this is from, um, this uh, icon over here is from Google. This is not new. You can find a lot about data and model cards coming from Google, for example. Uh, these are also some examples of what we can see there. We have model architecture. We have uh, the properties, the outputs, the applications. Um, we can find it um, also Usually, the normal metrics, so those related with accuracy. In this case, I should say that we uh, have also here some ethical considerations, so uh, we can also have uh, some uh, considerations about sensitive attributes and fairness. Uh, yeah, I like OWASP. <laughs> and we can also find about model cards and we can find about risk cards, which is, which is also very interesting. That is, how can we analyze and, and bring the potential negative consequences of using uh, AI um, related to their security vulnerabilities? So, to make um, trust cards, we need to go deep and we need to go more um, into properties that are not the usual metrics. Uh, but anyway, we need to have some way to measure how good it is. And when we think about trust and security, we can establish some KPIs and derive some metrics about the robustness, the transparency, the explainability, the compliance and ethical considerations. So these are topics very much uh, important for both, for trusting and for securing AI. Uh, we also have some other points for trust, fairness, reliability, generalization, user feedback and satisfaction. And for uh, security, we can bring also privacy preservation, authentication and authorization, adversarial detection and response, model integrity, secure data handling, resilience to poisoning, continuous monitoring and updates. Okay. What do we want from data cards and model cards? Um, we want uh, to enable the trust, and by this, to cover properties that are not usually considered and to measure how robust they are, how explainable they are, the privacy and the fairness we can expect. What can uh, be done in this field? So, uh, back to robustness, which is the capability of ML to operate as expected, even when they are under attack, so even when some perturbations try uh, to make it um, work uh, differently. And we have some metrics here, misclassification rates, under data perturbation by adversarial samples, evasion success. How can we do it? Um, so at low level, how can we understand and how can we um, generate adversarial samples for attacks and training? So this is to attack, uh, um, to attack AI. We can have, and I bring you some examples, IBM Zoo attack, that is a black box optimization attack. Uh, that will, that is um, applicable to images. Um, like I said before, with the examples I've shown, there are a lot of work 
regarding images, which is not uh, exactly the domain we work with when we are using AI for cybersecurity. And yes, this is ISEP, it's my school, the School of Engineering of Porto, and we, we have a library that builds black box evasion attacks, um, but for the cybersecurity domain. So this is not for bringing noise to images, this is to create a realistic adversarial samples that we are applying, for example, on um, network intrusion detection, on uh, providing realistic examples that can fool machine learning and while uh, having some uh, traffic, network traffic, uh, that is an attack, we can fool it um, by uh, making it believe it's a different type of attack and we can do it by making it even considering it's not an attack. Um, high level. There are also some tools that use these libraries to build attacks and that make it in a toolbox that brings different types of attacks that we can try. Um, the ART toolbox that brings uh, evasion, poisoning, extraction and inference threats um, just, yeah, again, it's for images. There is still uh, work to be done when we speak about tabular data, the one that really matters uh, for cyber. There is the Clever Hunts, uh, which is uh, the implementation of attacks uh, for neural networks, adversarial um, again, um, apparently able to deal with all type of data, but Examples are just for images. And there is the IB, um, Alibi Detect, um, that is Python, and it is focused on adversarial and rift uh, detections. And here we can find some examples for images, yeah, it's normal, for time series and for tabular data. They show some examples on a well-known data set of network uh, attacks. There is also some other tool that you can try that provides a benchmark to test model robustness. Okay, so we can teach models to be more robust by attacking them on a training phase so that they can learn to distinguish what uh, really is uh, um, uh, real data and what are adversarials and in this way to become more realistic. Of course, these tools, and, and um, I, I can go back to this slide, they um, generate this type of attacks. It can be used to attack a model or it can be used to make it more robust. My focus here is on making it more robust. Properties, explainability. It's important. When we are establishing a trust relationship with someone, uh, it's, it's easy if the person is transparent, if we can um, understand uh, their motivations, if we can understand a bit of their personality. I guess it's a bit the same here, and we have some metrics like coverage, perceive, perceived understandability, perceived technical competence, reliability, etc. So to, to work models, some of them are explainable by nature, essentially those that are based on, um, on trees, on, on decision trees, but uh, those that are really deep and black box neural networks um, and the, the, the transformers, they are really uh, opaque, um, but we can work and we can try to understand what is behind the model reasoning by using some tools, um, SHAP, is a very well-known tool in the field where we can give, get game-theoretic explanations of features. Um, interpret ML to, to, impl to implement and to show what comes when we try to fool uh, neural networks. Um, Captum for adversarial outlier and rift detection. And on local uh, models, Lime, which is also very well known on the academic community. And yeah, we are also working on that. On two sides of it, um, that is the um, black box attack based on uh, interval combination. This is a data set, public data set for network intrusion detection. And we are working on feature selection and on explaining which are the most relevant features and why. Um, and yeah, to, to contribute for uh, a trust on uh, what is being said by AI. And fairness. 
Uh, it's uh, maybe we are not uh, fair most of the times, but we wish AI to be fair. Uh, so to not be biased by uh, preferences, emotions, or other limitations that are for sure very much depending on the context. And some metrics we can have here are the disparate impact, differential fairness, statistical parity inference, demographic parity ratio. Look that this is, of course, depending on data. That's why I, I say that uh, trusting models and trusting data needs to be interconnected. And when we speak about these cards showing these properties, they are really depending on the context. How to improve fairness, also some tools and some techniques that can be used uh, to mitigate uh, the bias on data sets and model predictions. Um, the FAIR Learn, which is a package uh, that has mitigation algorithms. Uh, the IECITAS, which is a bias auditing to correct uh, biased models. Um, and some interesting technique, which is uh, machine and learning, that will uh, remove the influence of incorrect data or sensitive information. That is something we ambition, but it's not possible on the Internet. Once on Internet, always on Internet. So this type of machine and learning is a very um, interesting concept, I would say. And I, I bring you here also some pointer, which is CISA training. That is a framework that expedites the unlearning process. What is this about unlearning? Um, so imagine we train a model on a lot of data and what we wish then is to forget this data over here. So there are different approaches in a way that we can, uh, in this case, uh, kind of split the data and have uh, different models for training each of the data, but in a way that we can remove this data and keep the model as accurate uh, as before. That is uh, really something interesting, also coming from the fairness point of view, but intersecting with the privacy um, with the privacy field. Cryptography, also something um, very familiar for most of you, I guess. Um, and uh, the way we we are evolving in this field is, um, I don't want to um, unencrypt uh, the, the data to be able to apply a machine learning model. I want to keep it uh, encrypted while I do the, the machine learning. Um, but there are several approaches that come also not just from the ciphers we can apply to the data, but also on the way we can uh, distribute the models, keeping the data with the owners and just uh, sharing some part of the model's uh, parameters. I give you, again, some pointers. Uh, TensorFlow privacy that implements the concept of differential privacy. Microsoft homomorphic encryption library, SEAL. Um, the concrete ML, a set of tools for homomorphic encryption. And I'm also proud to say that we are working also here. We have Enigma, which is a tool that is able to um, implement a neural network with uh, the data encrypted. Uh, there is still uh, a long way to, to go because it is uh, usually very uh, hard computationally when we are dealing with encrypted data, but uh, it's possible. And it's, it is becoming uh, possible to do really um, homomorphic encryption. Then we have anonymization techniques that can be um, done with synthetic data generation. Uh, we have Presidio, those of you working with, um, with LLMs uh, maybe heard about it. We have uh, Citigan, uh, a synthetic uh, data uh, generator. Um, also, um, yeah, then what is um, our um, end goal? So we want uh, some identity of data that can increase uh, the trust we can have on uh, intelligent solutions based on machine learning. And we want uh, also a model identity card that is not just saying which is the accuracy, what, what is the algorithm type, what is the type of training. 
And for the data, we want to bring metrics about their quality, relevance, but also their privacy and confidentiality. For the model, we want to bring the explainability and transparency, but also the efficiency and sustainability. And on, on using uh, models with data, we want it to be able to be, um, to bring a good generalization and stability. Uh, but also robustness and security, and we want all of these to be trustworthy and, and fair. Uh, based on some uh, of the pointers I presented before, uh, we are working into, into this uh, direction. But AI is not just about models. There, there is a lot also, and I, I wanted to bring it here, the governance of AI um, has uh, people, has the application context, has a lot more than just uh, the models and, um, and the data. And uh, I know you are willing to go for the next, um, the, the context we have, and then the drinks. So I, I would like to, to give a final, um, to give you with the, some final questions. I say this all the time as a researcher. I always have more questions than answers because if I find an answer, I go for the next question and it never stops. Um, I believe we can work into this direction based on the things I was sharing with you in this, in this talk. But uh, what also I believe is that um, we cannot have these two domains uh, separate as they are. Um, I, I can also speak on my work at uh, ENISA. I'm also involved on the um, uh, cybersecurity skills framework, and we are working on identifying for each of the cybersecurity professionals' profiles what is the benefits each profile can take from AI and what is um, the demanding on securing AI that impacts each of the profile. We started by saying, oh, it has a lot of impact, for example, on the penetration tester. Yeah, it can benefit from AI. There are some tools um, based on reinforcement learning that can help and automate the process, but also a penetration tester should know how to uh, identify the vulnerabilities of an AI solution. And then we realize, uh, going profile by profile, that all of them are impacted by AI. Um, so what, what I think that is essential is that we have these two domains together. And now, speaking as an as a academic, um, I told you in the beginning I'm, I'm also a professor. I, I teach people <laughs> what I know. <laughs> there are a lot of things I don't know, but at least I teach what I know. And I, I really believe um, it's not enough to have good academic uh, CVs on, uh, and good background on cyber and good background on AI. We need to work on uh, having also academic um, profiles that bring the intersection of these uh, two domains. I have experienced that in some of the research projects I, I have. Um, that is, when I put people from AI speaking with people from cyber, it's hard to understand each other. People from cyber uh, don't understand what is relevant data for people from AI, and people from AI need to adapt to the context. So um, I believe uh, there is a way to go. I believe we can work on, on trusting and taking the most benefit of AI, and it is essential to bring these two worlds uh, together. And that's all. Stay tuned. If you wish to know more <laughs> about what uh, is being done um, and if you are interested in knowing a bit more about some of the tools I was speaking about, um, feel free to contact me. It will be a pleasure to discuss these topics with all of you. You are not sleeping. <laughs>